All right. Welcome back, everyone. Next, we have ASP Isotopes, Inc. It trades on the NASDAQ under the symbol ASPI. It's a pre-commercial stage advanced materials company dedicated to the development of technology and processes to produce isotopes for use in multiple industries. Please welcome its CEO, Paul Mann. Nice to see you again, Paul. Welcome back. Nice to see you, Anna. Thank you for having me back on the show again. So uh, great to be All here. All right. The floor is yours. Call me back when you're ready for questions. Great. Okay. So hopefully you can see my slides. I'll run through our, our slide deck and we'll have some Q&A at the end. This should take about 20 minutes of prepared remarks and then some time for, for questions afterwards. So we're a NASDAQ, looking comp NASDAQ traded company. So we have the usual forward looking disclaimer. If you could read our 10K and 10Q filings for uh, full set of risk disclaimers, et cetera, that'd be great. So, so we're a company that, that is aiming to produce isotopes and um, we, isotopes came to three industries, medical, semiconductor, and nuclear energy. And uh, we aim to sell uh, isotopes to all three of those industries in, in years to come. We have three parts of our company. ASP isotopes, which is the central part, which is uh, producing stable isotopes. So these are isotopes uh, which we use to, to make things like radio medicines and nuclear power and that kind of stuff. Pet Labs is uh, actually Sub-Saharan Africa's largest producer of, of um, fluorine-based radio, radio chemicals for use in PET scanning, so for, for uh, treating cancer patients. Um, and then Quantum Leap Energy is a division we intend to spin out next year. That's focused on producing the fuels the world will need in the future, so specifically high assay low enriched uranium and uh, lithium-6 for nuclear fusion. Um, you know, our goals this year really are to sign, we've actually achieved most of these already this year, is to start production, to, to uh, start constructing an asset site upon outside of South Africa, and to, to sign enough uh, contracts by the company can become profitable uh, in, in the years to come. Uh, so what is an isotope? So when you think about different elements, so hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen, um, these are clearly defined different chemicals. You can separate them chemically, they look different. Uh, carbons are solid, the other two are gases. Um, you know, they are very different elements. Uh, but if we take the focus on carbon, for example, they're actually, and what, 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 what defines a different element is the number of protons in the nucleus. So hydrogen has one proton, oxygen has more, carbon has even more. So if you um, let's take focus on carbon, you know, carbon actually has three isotopes which have different number of neutrons inside the nucleus. So uh, carbon 12, 13, and 14, and these have different masses. Chemically, they're identical, but they're, they're very different from a, um, from a physical standpoint. And so, um, you know, ca carbon-14 is slightly radioactive, while carbon-12 and carbon-13 aren't. If we take the same uh, example to silicon, uh, silicon, which is sand you dig off a beach, for example, silicon, all, all sand looks the same, but some of it has a mass of 28, some has a mass of 29, and some has a mass of 30. And... Um, they have different properties. So silicon-29, for example, does not conduct electricity. So silicon is one of the main backbones of most semiconductors. Um, silicon-28 is a great conductor. Silicon-29 is not. If we can remove that silicon-29, then suddenly the conductivity increases thousands of fold, and that allows us to create semiconductors for things like quantum computing and artificial intelligence. And so thinking about what this means in terms of um, price and, and products we can sell, um, silicon, you know, bag of sand, a kilo of sand is probably a dollar a kilo. A kilo of silicon 28, about $600,000 a kilo. And going back to carbon, you know, a, a kilo of carbon, so a kilo of, of, of charcoal, about a dollar a kilo. But a kilo of carbon 14, $24 million a kilo. So we take these very basic chemicals and we convert them into very special materials that certain companies need for certain applications. And... <clears throat> One of the reasons why I got interested in this industry a few years ago is that supply chain is, is very challenged. It always has been challenged. You know, Russia supplies about 85% of the world's stable isotopes to, to the market. And, um, and, and the rest is basically produced in a couple of plants in Europe. There's no domestic U.S. supply of, of radioisotopes. So we have two, two technologies we use to enrich isotopes. The first is the ASP process, and the second is quantum enrichment. And so ASP, we basically take a, 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 a vertical cylinder and we inject the gas tangentially to create a vortex inside the tube. And then we, we use that vortex to, to, to put it through certain valves and flow directors to separate out heavy isotopes from light isotopes. 
Unlike a Russian centrifuge, it can only be used for heavy isotopes. This can do light isotopes as well. So, for example, you know, a Russian centrifuge is great for uranium, mass 235, but it really struggles with silicon, mass of 28. Our, our, our technology is perfect for that. Our plants are also much smaller, so they cost tens of millions of dollars to build rather than billions of dollars to build. Um, and there aren't any, any moving parts in them. Uh, the only moving part is, is the compressor. Uh, the downside of our technology is that we use a bit more energy than a centrifuge. That's one of the reasons why, why we intend to build uh, plants in Iceland uh, next year. Quantum enrichment is a novel technology that our, our scientists have developed, whereby we, we vaporize a metal, we pass it through a laser beam, and that laser beam ionizes one particular isotope. It charges one particular isotope, and then we can collect the isotope on a collector plate uh, and separate it with, with very high efficiency. In South Africa, we have three plants that we are either built or finishing off building. Two of them are ASP plants, and one is a quantum enrichment plant. <clears throat> Here are some pictures of plants now. So this is an ASP plant. So this is actually our, our carbon-14 plant. And so you see on the left there, you'll see the separator unit. In the middle, you'll see the light element recovery. On the right, you see the heavy element recovery. And this plant here can produce the world's demand of, of carbon-14. And here you'll see a picture of... Uh, one of our laser plants, and uh, this is a very basic laser plant, and this shows you how we have kind of dye lasers and lasers in combination to create a beam of light that have got certain wavelengths that allow us to, to strip out certain isotopes. So to summarize, our, our technology is cost-effective, it's modular, scalable, and very environmentally friendly. So let's move on to nuclear medicine and what the opportunity is in nuclear medicine. So this is one of the largest opportunities we have, a very, very, large, very large market, and you'll see here the symbiotic relationship between ASP isotopes and PET labs. So PET labs purchases a lot of stable isotopes, and it uses either an electron, a proton, or a neutron to convert that into a radioisotope that we can use to treat a patient with a disease. And ASP isotope produces stable isotopes. So you'll see on the left, they're stable isotopes we either produce or intend to produce over the next several years. So... Lithium-100 is likely the largest commercial opportunity within uh, stabilized steps. It's also probably the hardest uh, in terms of gaining market access. Um, you know, it's, it's a fairly, you know, healthcare markets move like glaciers rather than rivers. It takes a long time to, to convert um, users to, to use something like this. But we feel this is a perfect way of making technicium-99, which is you know, the workhorse of, of nuclear medicine. Now, the Euterbium-176 is likely going to be our first uh, really big commercial isotope that we sell. Um, the, the, the laser plant got completed recently, and we expect to start selling Euterbium-176 you know, either right at the end of this year or, or early part of next year. And um, Euterbium-176 is used to make Euterbium-177, which is the, the, main, uh, the main active ingredient into Novartis' new drug, Pluvicto. And so Pluvicto is a prostate cancer drug, uh, significant supply side shortages today, and um, yeah, our plant just started up recently. They're commissioning it right now. We produced in rich ytterbium. We expect it to be commercial, you know, fairly soon. And then um, zinc sixty eight is the, the final medical isotope we expect to produce in the near term. Uh, we expect this to be our first plant in Iceland, and, and zinc is used as a diagnostic marker. So before a patient can be can be treated with lutetium or actinium based drugs have to be treated with uh, or, or, or diagnosed with a gallium-based uh, diagnostic marker, and we use zinc-68 to make that. Demand is growing at uh, a you know, very, very rapid pace right now uh, because of these new drugs, and uh, we expect to enter this market next year. And then carbon-14, this is a picture of the carbon-14 plant. You saw some pictures earlier as well. So we signed a take-or-pay contract with a Canadian customer for carbon-14, and carbon-14 is used as a, as a tracer during the development of new drugs and new agrochemicals. And um, it's an FDA requirement. And so our take or pay contract with the Canadian customer uh, says that they will, um, they, will, they will purchase a minimum of two and a half million dollars a year, uh, potentially more. Um, and we're just waiting for our feedstock to arrive for, for this plant. This plant's been delayed by about six months because of the lack of feedstock. The feedstock, which the customer will supply, is currently stuck in Tennessee in the US. And it should get released soon and be sent to us, and then we'll start uh, start producing it. But the plant is working. It's currently separating carbon twelve and carbon thirteen. And it's waiting for our feedstock before we start producing carbon fourteen. So this shows um, summarizes what I just said a moment ago. So semiconductors. Um, 
as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you can take the silicon-29 isotope out of um, silicon, you suddenly get a, a, a semi, you can produce a semiconductor that may be thousands of fold more conductive and also conduct heat much more efficiently. So we've signed two contracts, one with a large US semiconductor company, one with a large global industrial gas company to supply them with um, silicon-28 you know, right around the end of the, this year. And this plant is almost finished construction. It should start commissioning in the, in the early part, yeah, in the late, early part, early part of November, December, and um, should start producing product, you know, this year for, 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 for supply in, in, the, in the near term. And then in addition to silicon-28, depleting germanium of the 73 isotope well, it allows germanium to become kind of superconductive, and that will uh, have a lot, lot, lot of use for that as well. And so we um, tend to supply supplying that from the same from the same plant. So I mentioned Iceland once. So one of the problems with South Africa, so where our plants are at the moment, where I'm sitting today, is that there is a lack of energy. Energy is quite expensive, and we use quite a lot of it in our ASP process. And so we intend to start building plants in South Africa in, in, in Iceland, um, probably starting later this year. And um, we've secured a long-term energy contract at sub five cents per kilowatt hour. And we've secured a piece of real estate and we're kind of <coughs> preparing to start uh, building plants there quite soon. So nuclear energy, quantum leap energy. So the problem is fairly well known uh, in that uh, you know, the world needs to double the amount of energy it produces by 2050 uh, whilst maintaining net zero targets. And um, that's the real problem for the world. Um, you know, I don't think they're going to do it without nuclear power. 24 countries have said they want to triple the amount of nuclear power by 2050. And that may help them achieve it, but it's not um, probably not alone is, is it sufficient to, to do it. Um, yeah, the problem with nuclear power is current nuclear power stations cost billions of dollars to build, take maybe 10 years to build, and they're put in the middle of nowhere where you need massive transmission grids to get them to populations that can use that electricity. The advantage of a small modular reactor, or SMR, is that they're much smaller and you can put them next to a population. Uh, the exclusion zone around Kuburg is, is six kilometers. The exclusion zone around a terra power nuclear reactor is 600 meters. So you can place them much nearer populations, which means you need much less transmission grids to get it to, 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 to the people. They're much cheaper to build. Think about, a model, think about a car. What made a car really cheap was the Ford Model T. So production line manufacturing, production line engineering. And, and that is, um, you yeah, that really drove down the cost of auto vehicles. You yeah, this, is, this, is, this takes nuclear power to production line manufacturing. And some of the companies involved in this space, Terra Power, uh, Bill Gates, the founder and chairman of Terra Power. You have Oclo, Sam Altman's company, X Energy and Rolls-Royce. And these companies have all invested billions of dollars over the years to bring these new, smaller reactors to the market, the next, next, next wave in nuclear power. One of the problems for all these companies is they require a new form of uranium called high assay, low enriched uranium. So traditionally, uranium is enriched to, to up to 5%, that's low enriched uranium. This, this uranium is enriched to 19.75. The problem is that there's no Western producer of commercial quantities of HALU. And so all these plants have been delayed because of, um, because of a, a lack of availability in, in HALU. Now, we think our technology is ideal for producing HALU. QE is perfect for producing smaller quantities of highly enriched, very special products. And this chart here compares um, quantum, in, quantum, quantum enrichment versus other traditional methods of, of enriching isotopes. So you'll see at the left, the centrifuge, it's a traditional centrifuge used by the Russians, uh, has, a, has an enrichment factor, an alpha of about 1.15. So you, know, you, you increase the enrichment every stage and you cascade these stages then you compound that enrichment factor across the cascade, and that gives you your overall enrichment. Now, the beauty about quantum enrichment is that our selectivity is exceptionally high, greater than 50, we say. And when I say greater than 50, I mean substantially greater than 50. So this is um, quantum enrichment, real-world experience for lithium-6 and lithium-7. So that chart on the right shows the feedstock at the top. Lithium-6 is at 7%. Lithium-7 is at 93%. One pass through the enrichment chamber and then lithium-6 is now at 90, you know, above 90%, and lithium-7 is below 10%. So that's an enrichment factor of 112. So 112 versus 1.15 is a significant difference in terms of how much enrichment we get per stage. And that should allow us to produce you know, products extremely cheaply versus a centrifuge. <clears throat> so people should be well aware of the problems in the nuclear fuel supply chain right now. 
for seeing tightness in all three components of it, the uranium ore, the conversion and enrichment, it's very rare for a commodity to triple or quintuple in price and see no supply side response to that, uh, to that price movement. That's what we've seen here in, 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 in these free markers. No one's really announcing a significant new capacity coming on stream straight away. And that's, that shows you how challenging it is to enter this industry. What does this mean for HALU? Well, you know, when, when uh, these SMRs are being designed, the cost of HALU would have been maybe sort of $5,000 a kilo. But now it's about $20,000 a kilo. That creates real concerns for those companies involved in this space. How do you get this um, you know, nuclear fuel to, uh, to be cheap enough whereby people in emerging markets can, can afford it? Now, one, one thing we're very excited about or optimistic about is that because our enrichment factor is so high, we believe we can take depleted tails, so depleted nuclear waste, other people's waste, and convert it straight to HALU. And obviously, this will uh, this will have a, you know a it'll remove a, a huge environmental problem, but b it'll help you produce extremely cheap halo that can really reprice the, the price of energy. And you know one of the things we have to do to be able to make sure that energy can be used globally is that we have to price, trade a discount to hydrocarbon based energy rather than rather than a premium. So just to, to summarise, you know, we have a proven proprietary technology uh, mainly in South Africa right now. Uh, 20 years of R&D has gone into to building this, this technology platform. And we have multiple secular geopolitical tailwinds helping drive demand for the products we expect to produce you know, later this year or next year. So I'll stop there and I'll take any questions. Hi, Paul. Thank you so much for that presentation. We do have some questions. Uh, we have a question from... Uh, Alex asking, is criticality an issue with your QE process, enriching U-235? So criticality is the problem in any enrichment process involving U-235. You have to demonstrate to the regulators and to the people who provide you a license that you're never going to be able to hit criticality. And one of the advantages of our QE process is that we, we, we do it in batches. So rather than having a continuous process of hundreds of kilograms of product inside the plant at a time, we only have a small amount of product being enriched at a time. And so we can we believe we can demonstrate very clearly to regulators that there's no chance of hitting criti criti criticality. But the, the regulator is really concerned about two things. The first is criticality or safety, and the second is proliferation risk. And they're the main, they're the main things the, the, the regulator is concerned about. And P asks, with so much money and attention being paid to AI power needs with SMRs, don't you think the demand timetable for more rapid HALU permitting and production will accelerate in 25 and 26? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the world needs more energy full stop. and uh, The U.S. needs a lot more for these kind of applications. Um, you know, you've seen some of the large companies express interest or, or actually investing in uh, more power, more nuclear power. Um, so... Um, so, so, yes, I expect investments to, to grow rapidly over the next several years in this industry. Totally. Brian says the recent PR mentions exclusivity with Terra Power. So what does this mean for the second MOU that ASPI has with another U.S.-based SMR company? You know, so, so Terra Power have offered to put a considerable amount of capital into this project and in return for that, you know, we, we've said we will not sign an identical agreement with another SMR company between now and a certain date in the future. So we're giving them time to put their capital into the project. And, um, you know, look, to our power have been to South Africa twice, um, you know, multiple times, actually. Now they've met with many of the government ministers with us to talk about our technology, what we're trying to do. And, you know, um, they're, 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 they're becoming great partners. So um, we're happy to give such a great company exclusivity. And Gustavo asks, uh, if you could talk about how long in the process it will take to build the HALU enrichment facility. Yeah, so um, the, the very critical step here is actually getting permission and permits from, from countries and from regulators to actually build the plant. Um, so it's difficult for me to give an exact timeline there. But, you know, we built our Euterbium plant in six months, so we can build fast. Uh, our engineers are motivated and uh, excited to get building. But obviously, there's, there are certain steps that are outside of our control. And so that'll be the rate determining step. Mark asks, when do you expect profitability? 
So, you know, we're expecting to exit this exit this year or early next year to start hitting free cash flow positive. Um, you know, we've signed, we've got three plants that are going commercial right now. Um, we've signed a number of contracts with customers. And so the minute we start, you know, commercial selling those isotopes, that should, that should, that should allow us to become uh, cash flow positive. And Mohammed says the statement ASP isotopes will not negotiate with third parties for the supply of HALU or work on another ASP technology based uranium enrichment facility. Asking is this binding or non binding? If you can clarify in that contract. So that part is binding. So there are binding, but there are certain, certain, certain components of the contract that are binding and certain parts that are non binding. And that's, that's a binding, that's a binding part of the contract. And he's asking if you're able to share today's presentation with a link, or is it on the website for future viewings? Yeah, so this presentation is on our website, so you can find that at www.aspisotopes.com. Go to the investor section, and you'll find the presentation there. Calvin states, it appears your potential partnership with TerraPower precludes ASPI from selling Halu to any other customer or even build a plant for another customer. So does this limit your potential Halu revenue growth? Yeah, so I can't go into exact details of what it does and does not allow us to do, but it's just, it's, it's, this, this, does not, this does not procure us to other customers. It does not limit our, our growth potential. Um, Terra Power have first rights over over certain quantities of it, and that's uh, that's the main main goal of this. If they're going to fund it, and we have we have to be in the, uh, the the logical thing is they have they have the first rights to the product coming out of it. Javier asks. By the, by the way, the best the best the best funding we hmm. have is is free capital. If, if we own the plant and they're going to pay for it, that to me is the best return on investment we can ever see. So happy for that. Sure. Uh, Javier asks, when next year is the QLE expected to spin out? Yes, we've said a couple of things are needed to, uh, um, to spin out QLE. The first is we have to have a location where we're going to build our first enrichment facility. And we haven't actually got an agreement yet with the government to build a, a plant in a, in a particular country. So that probably needs to happen. And the second thing is that ASPI has to be generating free cash flow by itself. Both of those conditions should be met by the first quarter next year, we hope. And that would that should lead us to, to spin the company out, you know, or we'll separate the two in the, in the first half next year, you know, hopefully. And Mohammed states it's a great presentation. It, it looks very promising in the near and long term. However, he asks, what are the challenges you may face in the short and long term? Yeah, look. Um, <clears throat> In the short term, starting three plants up at the same time is challenging. Um, we know, you know, if you asked me 12 months ago, I'd never expected that, but um, our carbon plants kind of been delayed by six months and our euterbium plants been accelerated by six months, so they're all coming at the same time. So that's a challenge, but listen, we, have, we have 130 scientists here in South Africa, 20% uh, have got PhDs, half have got advanced degrees, and they're working hard to get these plants up and running. And so far, so good. So that's a, a near-term challenge. And longer term, you know, this is an industry where most of our competitors are government entities and competing against the government is never much fun. You know, we benefit, we benefit from incompetent governments rather than competent governments. So right now we've got quite a good tailwind helping us, but that could obviously change. And, um, you know, we'll have to see. Dave says you have a number of opportunities coming online at the end of this year and next. Can you provide any revenue estimates for 25? Yeah, we've been careful not to give guidance um, just because I think small companies giving guidance is kind of risky because it's all sorts of things, you know, plus or minus a couple of months on a plant can make a huge difference to what's a very small revenue base. Um, but, you know, we've said the carbon plant should do two and a half million dollars a year minimum, maybe a bit more than that. Uh, we haven't given guidance for silicon. We signed two contracts. And we've kind of said it's $600,000 a kilo, that kind of number. And then for, for your terbium, we've said this plant will produce maybe a kilogram a year. And, you know, the price for your turbine right now is about $35,000 a gram. Uh, we expect the price at a considerable distance. Different, you know, discounts maybe assume $15,000, $20,000 a gram. And that should give you an idea of what our revenue should be for, for next year. Last question. You can close with this. Sean asks, what, in the what is the next catalyst that we should be looking out for? Yeah, listen, uh, commercial production from free plants is a pretty big catalyst. Signing more contracts with customers, 
And then, you know, getting permission from a government to enrich uranium in, in that country would be a huge catalyst because that, that allows us to really accelerate uh, the building of this plant. And so hopefully they should come in the next sort of few months. And so it's a lot of excitement, a lot of activity for investors in, in near term. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Paul, for joining us on the conference with this presentation and update. We really enjoy following along your journey. Thank you, Anna, and thank you to the listeners for their interest. See you next time. All right. See you again soon. All right, everyone stay with us. We'll be right back with our next presentation.